Hi, Chris Glynn here with the Nightlight Podcast. We have an extremely hot topic to share with you on the program today, and we're joined for the second time on Nightlight by Brother George. It's good to be back, Chris. Uh, great to see you again. We have a guest tonight on Nightlight. The topic is called The Purpose of Hell. There's just so much misunderstanding about hell, the nature of hell, and what its purpose is. And this misunderstanding of it causes people to view God, to view Christianity and the Bible in a negative light. That's right. I would like to take a deep dive into the scriptures and explain from the scriptures the true nature of hell and what God's purpose for it is. I think your listeners, many of them, will be pleasantly surprised and relieved, actually. Well, I hope so, George, because a lot, if not the majority of Christians, view hell as a place of everlasting punishment that awaits anyone who dies without first receiving Jesus Christ as their Savior. Of course, there are always people dying, but now death is very much in the news with all that's happening in the world right now. And People who lose their loved ones, whatever the cause of death, naturally worry or can even be tormented with the thought that their dear children or parents or dear old grandmother could be burning in a lake of fire forever just because they died without saying the sinner's prayer. But is this actually the case? Okay, well, let's get into it and I'll tell you. Actually, I'll let the Bible tell you, not me. (laughs) Right, yes, please. Well, we know for sure that the saved are in a beautiful place and that their happy state is eternal, and they can't lose their salvation. We're assured of that in many scriptures, such as uh, John ten twenty eight. Can you read it for us, uh, please, Chris? Have you got it in front of you? Yes. Yes, I do. John ten twenty eight, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Okay, well, that's clear. The saved cannot lose their salvation. It doesn't rest on the meaning of the word never or eternal even. It rests on this second part, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. In another place, Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, right? Right. We also know that conversely, the unsaved don't receive eternal life with God. John 3.36 says, It says, And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Okay, so that's plain and understood by almost every Christian. Now, to the unsaved. These unsaved include a wide variety of people with varying degrees of access to the gospel. So you've got people in the modern age in predominantly Christian countries where there's plenty of access. Yes. Then there are those who live in nations where the gospel or conversion to Christianity is forbidden. You've got those of other religions who were good people but are not saved. Right. And then you've got people in utterly remote locations who had no idea who Jesus is. That's right. You've got people who died young in life and didn't have much, if any, opportunity to be saved. You've got good people, bad people. People in all sorts of other situations and presently and throughout history. It sounds like it includes most of the world and, in fact, most of the people who have ever lived. Now, besides the Catholic Church, which believes in a sort of a second chance place for some called purgatory, right? the overwhelming pervasive doctrine among Christian denominations is really black and white. That is, that no matter who they are, no matter how they behave in this life or how much access to the truth and the gospel they had, the unsaved are all sent to hell, where they suffer the eternal wrath of God. Right. And hell is understood to be an absolutely horrendous and frightening kind of dark dungeon or cave-like environment ruled by the devil and his demons with everlasting flames, torment, torture, and suffering for the inhabitants. Right. We've all seen enough paintings and depictions of hell to get the picture. This particular viewpoint of God's dealings with the unsaved are based on scriptures, such as the following, which I'd like to ask you to read for us, please, Chris, if you don't mind. Matthew thirteen forty-nine to 50. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Uh, Matthew twenty-five forty-six. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. And Revelation 21, 8. 
But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So, if you read or know only these types of scriptures, which are the ones heavenly emphasized by most Christian teachers, on the surface, it sure sounds like the unsaved suffer eternally in some sort of fiery, hellish environment. Right, from those particular scriptures, it does. Now, this view of God dealing with the unsaved seems too harsh and vindictive to the honest observer. It becomes kind of like a roadblock to non-believers to come to faith, And it leads to some Christians to believe that God couldn't be so mean, so they instead believe the doctrine of annihilation, Mm. which is that rather than sentence the unsaved to eternal agony in hell, God at some point causes them to cease to exist. Right. It also causes some Christians to lose faith, and yet others to not even believe that hell exists. Yes. In fact, a Pew Research Center survey reveals that 73% of Americans believe in heaven, while only 63% believe in hell. And that's because of this particular one-sided dark view of hell, which causes people to just think, well, no, that, that couldn't be true, right? Right. Now, I'd imagine if such surveys were conducted in other countries, they would yield similar results. Yes, I'm sure they most probably would. So... George, are those scriptures we read all the Bible has to say about the fate of the unsaved, or or is there more? There's more to it than what we just read on the surface, Chris. And the fact is that there is a lot of misunderstanding regarding these verses, and the Bible does have a lot more to say about the unsaved and the realities of so-called hell. Inspiring you to dig deeper into God's Word, you're listening to Nightlight. Today what I want to do is um, thoroughly examine the scriptures on the topic and help people to happily discover that God's dealings with unsaved are far more nuanced, purposeful, and hopeful than what we've been led to believe. Good. What we'll learn from the scriptures is going to completely deconstruct the common simplistic view of hell, reveal its true purpose, and the infinite love and mercy God has for every single human that has ever lived. Praise God. But first of all, another question. Why is this important? Well, I'm going to give two reasons. One, because the unsaved are still important. Each individual is God's precious creation for whom Jesus died on the cross and whom he still loves. That's right. They are someone's loved ones, family, children, friends, etc., They're worried about their unsaved departed ones. Of course. Why wouldn't anybody be worried about them? They're still important, those people, right? Here's another reason this is important. The perception of the way God deals with the unsaved shapes the way people view him and affects the way we Christians represent him and his character to the rest of the world. That's very important. It's a very important topic. That's why I wanted to cover it. But before I get into it, uh, Chris, I want to uh, cover some principles to keep in mind for your listeners while we study the Bible on this topic. Sounds good. These are the principles. One, 1 John 4, 8 defines God's character. It says God is love. So no matter what passage of scripture we're reading or theological point we're considering, it must be viewed through the prism of this understanding of his character. So because he is love, Whatever he does, he does in love, with every person's best interests at heart, even when it comes to dealing with the unsaved. Wow, that's a key point to keep in mind, George. Two, God's character doesn't change over time. Hebrews 13, 8 says, can you read it please? Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Okay, three, there are some major translation errors as well as misunderstandings in most English Bibles regarding the words hell, eternal, fire, and torment, which are significantly different than the intended meaning of the original Hebrew and Greek. I'll get to that later. That's obviously very key. Four, the Bible often uses symbolic or metaphorical language to describe spiritual realities. Right. Five, Our belief or doctrine on important matters like this have to be based on the totality of what the Bible says about it, 
We can't just look at some well-known and rehearsed passages about it and come to a conclusion. You have to look at what the whole Bible says about it. That's very true. And finally, the Bible doesn't go into a lot of details about the afterlife. It just gives us what we need to know now. So there's still plenty of mystery regarding how God deals with every person from every age of human history. But we do have enough information to confidently come to some conclusions, which I'm going to share today. Okay, George, first, before we go any further, let's talk about the word hell as used in the Bible and what it actually means. What kind of place is the Bible talking about? Good. That, that's a great place to start. Okay, there are several different Hebrew and Greek words all translated as hell in most English Bibles. Right. These terms generally refer to not one place, but four distinct locations in the spirit world. But unfortunately, confusion occurs because many English Bible translations lump all four of these together and collectively translate them as hell, thus not distinguishing between the four and misleading the reader. So keeping things as simple as possible, can you explain what the different places called hell in the Bible are? The first one is a place called Sheol in the Old Testament Hebrew and called Hades in the New Testament Greek. These both refer to the same place, which conjures up a popular image of hellfire, but actually rather means the grave the place or realm of the dead or the netherworld. Okay. Now, according to scripture, this is a place in the heart of the earth where both the saved and unsaved temporarily go after death until their resurrections and judgments. Right. And within this place, there are at least two very different locations. One, a hellish side for the unsaved that is described in Luke 16 as a place of torment. We'll read that passage shortly. And the other, also mentioned in Luke 16, sometimes is called Abraham's bosom, was a paradisiacal and heavenly place of comfort for the Old Testament saints until their resurrection, which was at the time Jesus was resurrected. Yes. Although some Christians believe that even today the saved still go there until they're resurrected at the rapture. Now, in Matthew twelve forty, Jesus told the scribes and Pharisees that he would spend three days and nights between his crucifixion and resurrection in this place called Sheol or Hades. This is what he said. It says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Okay, now this was fulfilled. The scriptures tell us that he went to both the hellish side as well as the good side. That's Abraham's bosom or paradise. Just prior to his death on the cross, he told the unrepentant thief in Luke 23, 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And George, paradise couldn't have been heaven because Jesus had not yet ascended. He was still in the heart of the earth. Exactly. That's right. And uh, 1 Peter 3, 19 to 20 explains that he went to the hellish side to visit and speak to the unsaved. Can you read it, please, Chris? By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. That's a very interesting verse, George, because why would Jesus preach to the spirits in prison if there wasn't a hope of them getting out? But I imagine you're going to talk about that later. Yes, I am going to get to that. (laughs) Right, so Sheol, or Hades, contains or did contain two very different sections, a hellish side as well as a paradisiacal one. But unfortunately, both sides are translated as hell in many English translations thus confusing the reader. Sorry, George, just for those listening whose first language isn't English, can you explain what paradisaical means? Well, uh, paradise-like, a place you'd be happy to go to. Nightlight. What a delight. Okay, the next place in the New Testament, the Greek word is Tartarus. This is rendered as hell in English Bibles, but this place is not a place for the human unsaved. It's mentioned as a temporary prison reserved rather for fallen angels. 
So that has no relevance to humanity. Right. And there's a lot of detail, George, about Tartarus and the fallen angels who are imprisoned there in the Book of Enoch. Uh, very interesting. There is a theory that Tartarus is actually located physically or, or spiritually under Sheol or Hades. It's in the very lower parts of the netherworld. We don't know for sure, but it may be so. Well, that's interesting. But on to the last place, and this is very important. This is called, in the New Testament Greek, Gehenna. This is separate from uh, Sheol or Hades. This is the famous lake of fire. Yes. Revelation 20, 10 to 15 tells us that the devil, the antichrist, the false prophet, and the most stubborn, unrepentant of the unsaved, those not found in the book of life, are placed in there after the great white throne judgment, which occurs after Jesus' 1,000 year millennial reign on earth. That's right. Now, Jesus likened this place, Gehenna, to a location outside Jerusalem called Gehenna or the Valley of Hinnom. Now, this place was used by ancient Jews for child sacrifice by burning. Horrible. And later it was used in Jesus' day as a trash dump for garbage and dead bodies that were burned 24 hours a day. He used that place as a metaphor for the lake of fire. Other scriptures describe it as a fiery place burning with sulfur, a place of torment with extreme anguish, right? weeping and grinding of teeth. I mean, it just sounds abominable. You wouldn't want to go there. No, for sure. So those are the four different places, three bad and one good, that are unfortunately lumped together and translated simply as hell in most English Bibles. So people can't distinguish between the four. Now, the scripture passage that gives us the most insight into and a description of an actual person living in any of these various places called hell is Luke 16, 19 to 31. That's where Jesus tells the story of a rich man and a beggar called Lazarus, who after death, they're found in separate sections of the first hell we talked about called Sheol or Hades, that temporary place of the saved and unsaved. So we're not talking about Gehenna, the lake of fire. Right. Now, this story gives us tremendous insight into what life is like apart from God in the afterlife, no matter where the unsaved wind up. Chris, can I ask you to read it for us, please? There was a certain man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Okay, so... Lazarus dies and he is now in Abraham's bosom or the paradise side of Sheol or Hades, the place Jesus told the repentant thief that they would be in after they died. You know, I never thought of that. I always pictured Lazarus being in heaven, but of course that could not have been the case because Jesus had not yet been resurrected. So he was in paradise. Exactly. That's right. It's amazing what you can find out if you really look into the scriptures. It continues. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Okay, so the rich guy is in the hellish side of Sheol or Hades, referred to by some as the place of torments. Okay, please keep going, Chris. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. And now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, 
They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Okay, so there's some things about life in hell revealed by this story. The rich man in the hellish side of Sheol or Hades, he has consciousness. Right. He can reason, speak, and communicate with others. He also somehow has access to those on the paradise side, Abraham's bosom, and he can converse with them. Now, why is he allowed to do that? Good question. Why would God allow the saved to converse with the unsaved in the afterlife if the fate of the unsaved is sealed and there's no hope for them? What would be the point? That's something I never thought of before. That's a good question to ask, right? Okay. Also, why does the rich man ask for a glass of water? If those separated from God are completely and utterly sentenced only to torment and cut off from any and all blessings, why would he even think to ask? Another interesting question. Or, has the rich man seen others in the hellish side of Sheol or Hades receive some form of comfort from those on the other side, and so he wants some too? That's a reasonable question to ask, I think. Very good question. And another thing is, this rich man is in hell, yet, in spite of this, Abraham calls him child. There's a sense of compassion there, and he's still considered a son. I find that very revealing, actually. That's right. Now, there are very strong indications that the water in this story and the fire in this and other biblical references to hell are symbolic, and they don't demand a literal interpretation. Now, this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone because Jesus often used symbolic language to describe spiritual realities. Right. Now, a clear example of this is found in Matthew 5, 29 to 30. Can you read it, please? And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Okay, and the very next verse gives the same advice for when we sin with our eyes. So, if any of our body parts sin and cause us to spiritually stumble, should we slice them off with a butcher's knife? Obviously not. I don't think so. It doesn't make sense to take it literally, and no one does. Right, so that is obviously metaphorical and not something Jesus is expecting us to actually do. No, no not by any means, no. And, and no one does take it literally, right? Right. Jesus is just saying we should cut off sins that cause us to spiritually stumble lest we suffer the consequences, which Jesus called being cast into hell. But this reference to hell is also symbolic because it's translated from the Greek word Gehenna, which I mentioned before refers to the place of purging of waste outside Jerusalem, which Jesus used as a metaphor for the lake of fire. Right. So why in this passage would Jesus speak symbolically about cutting off body parts and then in the very next breath switch to speaking literally about hellfire. Good point. I think that's a reasonable question to ask, right? It's most likely that he's speaking symbolically in both instances. And George, what about the flames he speaks of? Are they also a metaphor? Well, fire is very often used in the Bible as a metaphor for purging and refinement of our character. Here's an example. Uh, 1 Peter 4.12. It says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Also, 1 Corinthians 3.13 tells us that the quality of our works will be revealed by fire. And 1 Peter 1.7 tells us that our faith will be tried by fire. None of these are inferring literal fire. Right, so the fire is clearly metaphorical. The well-known theologian John Piper explains it well in an article on his Desiring God website. This is what he says. Can you read it for us, please, Chris? He says, God is a refiner's fire, and that makes all the difference. A refiner's fire does not destroy indiscriminately like a forest fire. A refiner's fire does not consume completely like the fire of an incinerator. A refiner's fire refines, it purifies, it melts down the bar of silver or gold, separates out the impurities that ruin its value, burns them up, and leaves 
the silver and gold intact. Okay, so there's a great case to be made that the fire is not literal, but it's a symbolic of the purging process that people in hell will experience. Right, so how about the rich man asking for water? Was this also a metaphor? Probably. I believe this was symbolic of seeking some kind of comfort or relief from his torment. It could very well represent the living water Jesus offered the woman at the well in John 4, or the water of life Jesus offers freely to those who are thirst in Revelation 21, 6. Now, Abraham cites two reasons for denying the rich man the water. Which are? One, that he's being punished for his selfish life on earth, reaping what he sowed. And the other, that he's living in a restricted zone where visitors from paradise side of Sheol, Hades, are not allowed to go. And neither is he able to cross over to visit paradise. Right. And Christians widely use this restriction of movement as proof that there's no way out of hell, don't they? Exactly. They quote this often. But as I said, we can't rely on just one scripture to decide our theology. Absolutely. So let's look at this more deeply. Why is he in the restricted zone? What could the reasons be? Well, you can see obvious signs that he's unrepentant. He's treating Lazarus as a servant, and he has a similar attitude towards Abraham, demanding him to send a messenger to his brothers and arguing with him. Yes, that's right. You know, he sounds like a convicted criminal who's complaining about being in jail, who's not really sorry about his crime that got him there in the first place. Right. And that's probably why he can't get out or receive any relief. Feeling all right while listening to Nightlight. I'd like to move on now to another word in this story called torment. The rich man says he's in torment. Well, torment here is translated from the Greek word basanos, which is used three times in the Bible. Now, the true meaning of this word is extremely revealing. And I'd like you to read this for us, please, Chris. It says, The testing of gold and silver by the proving stone with a connotation of a person severely tested by torture to reveal truth. And the rack or instrument of torture by which one is forced to divulge the truth. Okay, so the original Greek of this word torment tells us that the rich man is actually being tortured in some way for a purpose. And that purpose is to reveal truth. Interesting. And there's a derivative of this word basanos, which is called basanistis, which means tormentor, the one who torments. And it's found in the parable of the unforgiving servant who couldn't pay his debt. Can you read Matthew 18, 34, please, Chris? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. Okay, now, so in this parable, the purpose of the torment was not to merely punish him, but to torture him until he repents and pays the debt. The assumption being that once the debt was paid, he would be a free man. That's right. So these two Greek words and their various related words are used throughout the New Testament in regards to punishment of the wicked, and they all have the same connotation, torture to reveal truth, to get the wrongdoer to confess and to repent. George, you're revealing a lot of truth that I'd never thought about in regards to this very well-known story. So to bring it all together, what do... What does it all mean? What all this means is that the flames mentioned in the Bible regarding hell are symbolic of the torment of an intense purifying process the person in any parts of hell goes through. The torment they endure is because of living with the results of their sins, which they've not been cleansed of. Yes. And the continuation of life in sin in hell will be a form of spiritual and mental torture, which God allows them to continue to experience for the purpose of bringing them to a place where they acknowledge the truth about themselves, that they made wrong choices, and that they need salvation. Jesus loves you. you. George, besides this very well-known story of the rich man and Lazarus, which Jesus told in Luke chapter 16, are we given any more information in the Bible about what life in hell is like? Right, good question. Well, The reality is we aren't given much information about how life will be practically lived out in hell, whether that's in Sheol or Hades, 
or Gehenna, the lake of fire. But we're given some strong clues, which I want to share here. Now, the book of Revelation describes heaven as a beautiful place permeated with the Spirit of God where he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. There shall be no mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Yes. I think we can safely assume, though, that separation from God and life in hell will be the opposite of paradise in heaven. In hell, the former things, the curse and the sins of humankind will not have passed away and will still be present. Right. You can imagine the difference. Heaven being the ideal society with loving people who've been cleansed from their sins, living in God's presence, living much like we do in this life, but as God originally intended and with the pleasant sensations and emotions intensified and with rewards and blessings according to their works on earth. Right. But hell is probably the inverse of heaven, a society full of people who have not been cleansed of their sins, living away from God's presence, living much like they do in this life, but not as God originally intended, and with the negative sensations and emotions intensified and being punished according to their deeds on earth. So like the rich man, they continue to live with pride, anger, war, strife, fear, sickness, you name it. It's not going to be a fun place by any means. No, it's going to be horrible. And I imagine, George, it will be a complete separation from God with no nature or anything in hell that God created. I wouldn't say that there's any indication that there's not going to be any nature whatsoever in hell because there'll be good people in hell. That's true. You know, there'll be the the good unsaved who didn't have a chance and that that type of people. And I, I, I can't see a loving God placing them in a place of total and utter separation from any blessing whatsoever. Even in the Luke 16, um, the rich man had, he could speak with Abraham and, and uh, presumably Lazarus as well. He had access, and even the people, the unsaved who remain on the earth during the millennium, they have the beautiful earth that's still in existence there. They're unsaved. They remain there after the um, Battle of Armageddon. That's true. I would still think that God still blesses at least most of the unsaved, the good ones, with a decent place, even in hell. The problem that really torments them is their sin that remains. And then the rest of the community there as well are still living in their sins. I mean, can you imagine living in a place? That would be a torment. Uh, You take all the good people out and they're in heaven, the saved, and you're left with the unsaved in one community. Uh, To me, that would be torturous. Okay, let's move on to another question or conception that most people have about hell, and that is that hell is forever and ever and ever without end, without any hope of ever getting out, once in, forever in, without any exceptions. But is this actually the case, in your opinion, from what you've studied in the Bible? Well, no. No, actually, the Scripture doesn't explicitly say that in any place. In fact, it gives a lot of information to the contrary that could lead you to the conclusion that there is a way out. First of all, just God's nature. Now, even um, Daniel Clark did a a class on this in one of your previous episodes. Right. But, okay, let's go ahead and talk about how God judges the unsaved. Would that be okay? Yes, please, go ahead. And then we'll get to that in a moment. Okay, so there's this erroneous perception out there that God's judgments of the unsaved are vindictive and a reflection of his anger with them. He might be justifiably angry with many of them, the real bad apples, who caused a lot of damage on earth. And as I said before, there'll be all kinds of people in hell and God will judge them individually. Yes. Now in places like Luke chapter 12 verses 47 to 48 and Revelation 20, 12 to 13, the scriptures tell us that both the saved and unsaved are judged individually and rewarded or punished according to their works. Right. So this indicates that there will most likely be a wide variety of classes, if you will, of people in both heaven and hell. And there might even be, especially in hell, a variety of locations where people are assigned according to their works. Right. I think it would make sense that God would arrange some level of separation between the people who were good in this life and those who committed violent crimes. So of course. let's say a wonderful Hindu person from a remote Indian village who lived a thousand years ago and who never heard the gospel, they'll probably be dealt with very different to a guy like Hitler. They'll probably be living much like they do now, but 
still in their sinful state in a community of similar people and thus subject to all the problems that come with that. But hopefully, the continuation of and dialed up intensity of the effects of sin in hell or Hades will prompt them to change and to a positive outcome and even repentance and acceptance of Jesus eventually. Yes. So I would imagine that many such good people will repent quickly if they land in hell. You would think so. But bad people or even wicked people like Hitler, well, I wouldn't like to be in their shoes. Guys like him are going to suffer terribly, even in Hades. Absolutely. And then you've got all these kinds of people who are in, in between those two extremes. One way to understand all this is by thinking of our own justice and uh, correctional system here on earth. Here on earth we have different grades of punishment and different lengths of incarceration in the correctional system. That's right. On one extreme you've got prisons for low-level offenders where the inmates have relatively comfortable living conditions and many privileges and then on the other extreme you've got maximum security prisons and even solitary confinement for the worst offenders. But it's understood virtually worldwide that for the very vast majority of offenders, the ideal goal of the correctional system is not just separation from society and punishment, it's rehabilitation and hopefully eventual reintegration into society as honest, law-abiding citizens. That's right. So this leads us to, is your question, is hell eternal? The Bible doesn't specifically state word for word that people can be saved while in Hades or the lake of fire, but neither does it specifically say they can't. What it does do, though, is very strongly suggest it. In fact, 1 Peter 3, 18 to 20, which I mentioned before, tells us about how during the three days between his crucifixion and resurrection, Jesus even went to Hades to preach or make some sort of proclamation to those imprisoned there. That's right. Now, it doesn't reveal what he said to them, but he had just given his life for the redemption of all humankind. So it just makes sense that he would have gone there to preach or proclaim that he still loved them and that perhaps the time had come for at least some of them to have a second or even a first chance. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay, now whoever means anyone, and God's promises don't expire at death. They're eternal, right? Yes. Now, I know many Bible readers and scholars will point out that there are several scriptures that say that hell is forever or eternal, but this is another translation error. This is actually brushed over common knowledge among theologians and scholars of Greek that the original Greek words translated as forever and eternal are aeonis and aeonon, which actually mean an age or ages. So that's not an infinite amount of time, but a finite amount of time. Yes. So that's a very strong indication that hell is not forever. And Second Peter 3, nine tells us about God's desire that every person would be saved. Can you read it, please, Chris? The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us would not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There are plenty of other scriptures along this theme of God's desire to bring all of his creation back to him eventually. So yes, while God is a God of justice and judgment, and it will definitely be at the least very unpleasant and at the worst excruciatingly torturous in hell, God is also loving. God is good and God is merciful. And Psalm 100 Verse 5 says, For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. And George, in Psalm 136, it repeats 26 times that his mercy endureth forever. There you go. There's no limits to his mercy. It's everlasting. And this never changes because God's loving character never changes. Amen. Praise God. To sum all this up, Chris, it's clear that hell is definitely not a place you want to go to, especially if you've been a very bad person. But no matter who winds up there, the ultimate purpose of hell is for them not just to be punished, but it's correctional for the purpose of rehabilitation and hopefully eventual salvation. Now, it might take a very long time for some of the worst, even having to go to the lake of fire. 
but neither God nor the saved will be able to completely enjoy heaven while the unsaved are still suffering in hell. Wow, what a thought, but that's really true. God will never stop loving and pursuing the unsaved. And hopefully, at least this is his desire, there'll come a time when all are happily reconciled with him. Wow, we're talking about universal reconciliation. After the whole dramatic story of creation, the fall of man, human history, the end time tribulations, God's judgments on the wicked, and the torments of hell, that would be a wonderful way to end. Nightlight. You're listening to an international edition of Nightlight, shining God's love light to the world. I've given uh, plenty of new ideas in this class and food for thought for, I would imagine, a lot of people. You definitely have. I urge them to search the scriptures. That's how you know the truth. And if they want to look into it further, I'll include links to plenty of reference material in the description. So you can follow up on that if you want. Good. Nothing I've said here, neither your other teachers that have gone on your show to talk about this particular topic is not from the scripture. It's all taken from the scripture and looking into the original Greek meanings and Hebrew meanings of words. Absolutely, that's right. So if there's anyone out there who's shocked by this and who would like to challenge it, I would urge them to first look into the scriptures like the Bereans in the book right. of Acts and prove what's been taught here. And if they have any questions, they're welcome to ask in the comments. I'll be more than happy to answer. George, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you. Really uh, appreciate your work, Chris, and uh, pray that the show and every other show will be a blessing to many. And if you enjoyed George's teaching, please be sure to subscribe to his Bible Made Easy podcast channel. You'll also find the link below. God bless you. Bye for now.